This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance Broadcast. During my years as a psychology researcher for the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., I became profoundly convinced that human beings utilize very little of their tremendous inner potentials. Psychology has long estimated that people in their entire lifetimes employ only about 10% of their total mental resources, which is like setting up your living quarters in the broom closet of a nine-room house. There is so much more to life. You were created to live, not merely to exist, but to live. A stone, a pebble, a grain of sand exist. But human beings possess the potential to live spiritually with joy and abundant meaning. One year or ten years from this moment, you are going to be essentially the same person you are right now, except for three things. The thoughts you think, the experiences you have, and your inner spiritual life of prayer, meditation, and worship. But these are elements over which you largely have control. You possess the power to choose whether the thoughts you think and the things you do are going to be good, loving, and brimming with hope, or vengeful and fraught with fear and doubt. Realize that your moods and attitudes can become psychological and emotional habits. Why is it that some individuals invariably smile when they meet people, others do not? Habit. Why do some speak curtly, others courteously? It becomes habitual, but habits are initiated in the mind and can be altered in the mind as well. Your patterns of living are established by decisions, and decisions are then translated into behavior. Habits are first cobwebs, then cables. In every situation of life, this is the fundamental alternative, determination or despair, faith or fear, hope or discouragement. Choose determination, choose faith and hope. God created human beings to live in affirmative dynamism, full of power and purpose. And by choosing to express these victorious attitudes, you will begin to realize your fuller inner potentials. There are no such things as hopeless circumstances, hopeless problems, hopeless difficulties. There are only individuals, human beings, people who have become hopeless about their difficulties, problems, and circumstances. Jesus of Nazareth taught, with God, all things are possible. And ever remember, the kingdom of God is within you, a fragment of God's very spiritual essence and nature indwells your mortal mind. Consider a concept in psychology which is germane to what I'm saying. Dr. Leon Festinger's cognitive dissonance principle states that when your attitudes and your behavior are at odds with each other, in dissonance, when you're feeling one way but behaving in an opposite way, the tendency is for your attitudes to shift in the direction of your behavior rather than vice versa. You resolve this psychological disequilibrium by organizing your life around the way you are behaving. How you act mobilizes your psychological energies in either positive or negative fashions. But the greatest psychological motivator of all is faith in God. Faith is not just an idea. It is a way of living, behaving, acting. Faith is assuming a truth to be true, then acting on that assumption. Suppose your good friend tells you he'll meet you at a cafe at 6 o'clock. You assume that he will keep his word, and you act on that assumption by appearing at the cafe at the hour agreed. We act on assumptions continually. When you open up a can of soup and eat it, you're acting on the assumption it was safely prepared and that it won't poison you when you drive down the highway. You're acting on the assumption the highway continues even over the next hill or around the next curve where you cannot see it. You assume that it doesn't end at a cliff or in a pile of rocks and timbers. You drive over hills and around curves acting on the assumption that the highway goes on. But having faith in God is acting on the greatest assumption of all and can consequently make the greatest possible changes in your life and your feelings and your inner psychology. Resolutely assume the greatest truths of historic religion, then act upon those assumptions. Assume the truth that you are a son or daughter of God, infinitely loved, infinitely valuable, a brother or sister to every other person on this planet of whatever race, whatever culture, whatever color. Assume that truth, then act on that assumption. Behave the way a boundlessly beloved son or daughter of God would behave and live. Act on the assumption that the Spirit of God indwelling your mind is transforming your attitudes and your thoughts and guiding you in your quest for the will and wisdom of God for your life. Act on the assumption that death will not be the end for you. 
but that life will go on, that eternal life will be an eternal adventure of living by eternal values, by truth and beauty and goodness. Assume the truth that this is a friendly universe and that you're just beginning a thrilling personal quest for perfection. Then act on these great assumptions and your life will be astoundingly transformed. This new definition of yourself, this new concept and understanding of yourself will in fact create a new self, or more accurately, permit you at last to discover your true self, the real you whose nature has so long been buried under strata of doubts, hesitant uncertainties, and fears. By remembering my maxim that faith is assuming a truth, then acting on that assumption. You can begin to live with a newborn exuberance by simply acting on the assumption that you are in truth what you are, the valuable, important son or daughter of the eternal God you are. Apply this principle, and your life will literally never, ever be the same again. There are many imperfect and problematic aspects of human life, but it is not necessary to worry about them, to deal with them. It's entirely possible to be concerned about an issue, think about it, plan about it, without worrying about it. Is this not what Christ meant when he said, Fear not, be not anxious, be of good cheer. Let not your heart be troubled, he said, neither let it be afraid. These words are powerful spiritual antidotes to anxiety, fear, and worry. One time on a university campus, a student said to me, How can you believe in God? If there is a God, he said, why did God make such a world with so many problems and difficulties? This is a painful planet. There are struggles on every side. The student said, I could have made a better world than this, to which I replied, that's why God put you on this earth to make it a better world than this. God is not going to solve all of our human problems for us. God is not like some unwise parent who would work all his children's arithmetic problems, write their school themes and their essays, do their homework for them. That would be no way for children to learn and grow. Neither will God solve all of our problems for us. God created this an unfinished world, an incomplete planet, a world in the making, and part of the challenge of life is helping this world to become what it was made and intended to be. God's purpose is not to make life easy. God's purpose is to make life great. And somewhere in every problem lies a potential solution. Your challenge is to find it. Think of all the diseases medical science has conquered in the past 300 years. From Pasteur's vaccination for smallpox to the Salk vaccine for polio, science simply learned to trigger the antibodies produced by the disease itself. In generations to come, hundreds of other problems will likewise be found to contain in themselves the potentials of their own solutions. Problems should be seen as stimuli, not as discouragements. Individuals rise to their highest heights, not when everything is easy. But when unexpected difficulties arise and they meet those problems with valor and vigor, with the sort of spiritual spunk God intended us to display and portray in the face of problems and difficulties. The Swiss psychiatrist Dr. Carl Jung once wrote, Where your weakness lies, your task in life begins. There comes a zest for life when you begin to be challenged by your own inadequacies and you discover that you can look at your weaknesses not as liabilities but as possibilities. Challenges. Be you therefore perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect, said Jesus. Whenever you're tempted to feel worthless or your self-esteem is suffering, remember that you possess vast unexplored inner resources, uncharted terrain in the spiritual and psychological realms of your mind, the exploration of which can enormously enrich the quality of your life. The kingdom of God is within you. Something of God, a glowing ember of eternity, burns within your mind. Seek its illumination and be inwardly inspired and enlightened by it. In view of the minute proportion of your potential which you utilize during your lifetime, the 80 to 90 percent of your unused possibilities which thus lie dormant through the years, it is instructive to realize that you have literally never been as happy as you could be. You've never been as interested, as absorbed by life, as stimulated, as inspired, as challenged, as joyous and loving as you could be. God created you to have life and to have it more abundantly. So much yet lies ahead for you. Microphysiologists have learned that during the time from the conception of a baby to its birth, 
it grows from the two microscopic parental cells to some 26 trillion cells in its body. Each one of us, you and I, went through that incredible period of growth and development during our nine months in the womb. And yet, astonishing as that may be, from two to 26 trillion cells, that is little compared to the potential spiritual and philosophic development of which you and I are capable. In inner fellowship and companionship with God, you begin a process of spiritual advancement which extends through the endless eons of eternity, the future, a thrilling Star Trek from here to the boundaries of infinity. Time and again, the story of humankind reiterates that the crucial question is not what popular opinion thinks about some individual, but what that person thinks and knows about himself and within himself or herself, the inner sense of orientation and guidance. A mighty ship, a sail upon the sea, is not navigated by taking a vote of the crew, but by taking a reading of the stars. And great lives are likewise lived not merely to please the public, but to attain ideals and to make this a better world, to fulfill ultimately the will of God. The secret of greatness is to be true to the best you know. And as you grow, then, the best that you know will become better and better as you discard lesser and incomplete understandings in favor of greater visions and nobler aspirations. If you sincerely seek to live by the principle I'm portraying as being true to the best you know, you can be assured that in time you will experience the craving to find and to believe in God, the ultimate source of all goodness. But more may be yours than simply believing in God. You can find and know God. This is far beyond the mere intellectual process of finding out about or studying theology and knowing about God. The personal finding and knowing of God in your life, in your experience, is a discovery brimming with reality and satisfaction. Think of the difference between a textbook on the science of botany contrasted to sitting in a meadow full of fragrant flowers, between a map of the ocean and standing on the shoreline in the surging white-foamed surf. Think of the difference between an astronomer's chart of the constellations and, by contrast, standing yourself outside on some clear midnight enraptured by the starry skies above you. These are the sorts of differences there are between knowing about God and knowing God, finding out about God intellectually and finding God to the satisfaction of your soul, finding God as your father and your friend, and living with this newfound burst of confidence, courage, and faith. As a son or daughter of God in a friendly universe with a family feeling toward all of humankind and knowing that life for you has just begun, life abundant, life real, life joyous, in a universe of meanings and values, the exploration of which will be for you your eternal adventure. And if you're interested in these topics, write to us. We want to hear from you at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. That's the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, or abbreviated SRI. For those of you listening in other countries around the world, over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell the mailing address. SRI Box 3080, Oakhurst, O A K H U R S T, California, C A L I F O R N I A, 93644, United States of America. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Seven Principles of Prayer, Life After Death, What Does Happen When You Die? If you're interested in these topics, no cost, no charge, no obligation. Nobody's going to come to your door with an attache case and try to sell you something. Simply write to the Spiritual Renaissance Institute Box, 3080 Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, May God's will be done by you. Good day.